speaking of that um i mean there's a lot of stuff i can get into but just to kind of collapse a few questions so we can get to some things today um i'm going to try to combine this with the historical point you made and and also a contemporary or something going on a current event going on in the news um you had talked about um clues in the la paz chapter i'm referring to that for people who might want to read the book um that's in the second section and you talk about the the um the Mrs. the general coup and the colonel coup um and and the difference between those and you say coups overall correct me if I'm wrong are reactionary because most of the time they don't pull from the people um they're usually just done by you know some kind of it's like a palace coup or something but there are differences you know depending on what historical example you're looking at um and those do tend to be pretty i don't know prevalent but they happen more than often in a lot of countries that you know we once knew as the third world um so if you want to put that on one side and if you could speak on that distinction because i think that's just a interesting the way you broke it down in the book and i'll let you do that is an interesting way of thinking about it and then also with that view how do you and i'll maybe re-ask the question but how does that relate to some of what's going on in um that just the the coup that just happened in Niger, um the the um the coup that happened in Burkina Faso, um with the talking about Guinea, um and just what's going on in the kind of francophone um west western African region. How how do you see that related to um that analysis of coups and also if there's any kind of progressive action that may come out of that? And I'll have some follow-up questions for that and then we can get out of here. Yeah, well, firstly, um, it's important to go back to uh, two developments. One is that in the 1990s, there was a moment of quite significant hope in countries in the Sahel. For instance, in Mali, um, the um, uh, president of Mali was Alpha Omar Konare, uh, somebody that I knew very well. Uh, Alpha Omar Konare came out of the socialist tradition. You know, the Soviet Union collapsed. He was quite pragmatic in those years. But he was eager to move uh, Mali in a progressive direction. Um, you know, he one of the things he very much asked the Clinton administration to help him with was to help him with the debt crisis. He said, if we can get the debt crisis off our back, then I can try to negotiate the problems in the North, the so-called Tuareg question, the, the national liberation struggles of the Amazigh people, the Tuaregs and so on. He said, I can, if I have the means, I can uh, settle that. You know, we can make an autonomous region, maybe we can provide more development support and so on. Um, you know, and he said, we'll also need to develop in the central part of Mali, the question of the uh, clash between uh, the nomadic peoples and sedentary peoples, you know, the Fulani play a big role in the central region of Mali. And he had worked all this out, but we need debt relief. We need capital. We need to be able to use our own resources to tackle these things. And the U.S. government denied him. Hmm. And Konare then was gone. That's the first development that there was a possibility for the Sahel region to advance certain goals of national development and so on. That was completely rejected by the US. And then the French, when they adopted the Euro in 2002, um, toward the end of this period, insisted that these countries um, not only continue with the CFA, which is the colonial franc, you know, there's still eight countries in the Sahel and West Africa still use the French franc, the colonial franc, but they also keep 50% of their reserves in the French treasury. Yep. It's a huge discount to yep. France, you know, yep. um, and the French still intervene regularly. Okay, that's one set of issues and problems. The, the region was not able to decolonize significantly against the French, and they were not able to get out from the claw of the International Monetary Fund. And therefore, all their internal problems remain. Okay, problem number one. Problem number two, when the French and the United States destroyed Libya, um, at the time, they brought in Libyan jihadis who were fighting in Syria and so on, old members of the Libyan Islamic fighting group, younger people who had gone into Al-Qaeda and so on. They brought them into Libya. This crowd of people moved from Libya. Some of them moved into Algeria. 
into southern Libya, into the town of Sabah, and then moved into Mali. In fact, mm. uh, in rapid terms, over a third of the uh, country of Mali was taken over by these jihadi groups, Al-Qaeda of the Maghreb, which established a caliphate, centered at Timbuktu. You see, the way they did it, remember what Konare said, they made a deal with the Tuaregs, with the Amazigh people of the north of Mali, and they made a deal with sections of this fight between the sedentary and the nomads, you know, sections of the Fulani community and so on, joined up with this Al-Qaeda rebellion. They took nearly half the country. The French then intervened through Operation Barkhane in 2013, military intervention into Mali. At the time, the Malian government in Bamako was super stressed about the possibility the whole country will be overrun. So they, in fact, invited the French in. This strengthened France's hold across the Sahel. In fact, from the edges of West Africa, from Guinea, from Burkina Faso, Mali, into Niger, very significantly, where the French have a major garrison in the town of Arlit in northern Niger, north of Agadez, where the U.S. government began to build the world's largest drone base, um, which is there in the center of the town of Agadez. Um, so in these countries, the French began to dominate again. They created something called G5 Sahel, tried to bring the militaries on, on side and so on. Um, the Americans brought their military force in. The British came in from something called the Accra Initiative. Okay. Now, neither the economic problems nor the militancy that these countries were experiencing were dampened by this major intervention by Western military forces. At this time, um, inside these countries, there was an attempt for political reform. But I must say, the attempts for political reform all failed. Inside the military forces, incubated young officers who were frustrated because they saw their homeland being destroyed. Um, young officers incubated, some of them in touch with older officers. In Niger, for instance, some older officer played a very role, a big role, particularly General Modi played a very big role. And so you saw a series of coups in the Sahel, one in Guinea, two in Burkina Faso, two in Mali, and now one in Niger. Five coup d'etats took place in four countries. Um, uh, you know, why? Uh, sorry, six coup d'etats in four countries. Why? Why did this happen? Well, because these young officers um, were very much dismayed by the lack of sovereignty of their countries. In fact, the two coups in Mali, the two coups in Burkina Faso took place because the first coup didn't satisfy the agenda of the people who, of the people really, apart mm. from the coup makers of the people. And so what is the character of these coups? Number one, deeply anti-Western, particularly anti-French, deeply anti-French, but generally anti-Western. That defines these coups. Secondly, they have gone back and brought old ideas from the national liberation era. The new leader in Burkina Faso, for instance, went to the Russia-African summit dressed in the uniform of Thomas Sankara, mm -hmm. who led that country between 83 and 87. The, the red beret, the beige military fatigues. He, he looked like he was trying to be Sankara. It was incredible. He spoke with a Sankaraist language. Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea have talked about reviving the Federation of Guinea. This goes back to ideas from Sekou Toure. Mm -hmm. You know, old national liberation ideas back on the table. The French, the Yanks thought that Niger would be the safest pair of hands. They, in fact, withdrew troops because they the French were thrown out of Mali, thrown out of Burkina Faso. They withdrew their troops into Niger, thinking Niger would be the safe hub. Well, little did they know that these militaries are also in conversation with each other. People in Niger were not blind to what was happening on their borders. So um, there was a real anger with the president, Bazoum, who is very close to the Yanks. Blinken went to see him, for instance, very close to the French. He allows France to basically steal um, you know, Nigerian um, uranium. Uh, one in three light bulbs in France are powered using uranium from the town of Arlit, the one that is garrisoned. Um, so 
presidential guard on the 26th of July uh, moved against Bazoum, Mahmoud Bazoum. Um, they held him in the, in the palace. There was an attempt by sections of the military to free him. But very soon, by 24 hours, 10 members of different uh, military and police um, you know, uh, uh, forces came together to create a council, the you know, council to safeguard the homeland. And they have taken charge of the country. Behind them is a guy who has been previously involved in a coup. As I said, General Modi, involved in a coup in 2010, played a big role then in trying to you know, establish a kind of, let's say, call it a left orientation. So anti-French, reviving the old national liberation um, you know, agendas, but also interestingly pro-Russian. This is curious. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Asima Koite going to um, uh, Moscow dressed like Sankara, talking about how Russia is going to be important for the Sahel. Um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the role of the Wagner group, that Russian mercenary group that may have tried to do a coup in Russia. Um, right. There'd been a lot of talk about the Wagner group in Sahel. But this is not the, the key thing. The key thing is these militaries understand that they have an opportunity to play all sides in order to establish their own sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, what's important to them is establishing their sovereignty. And now Niger, very important country, fifth largest producer of uranium, rich in gold and so on. I think if this talk of the great Sahel Federation continues, um, you know, finding some way to unify Burkina Faso, Mali, Guinea, and Niger, not into one country, but into a federation. This could be very interesting for developments in Africa as a whole. Uh, people in different capitals are watching this. What was interesting is Goite goes to Russia and he attacks the African Union. He says that, why are you criticizing us for trying to reestablish sovereignty? You know, countries with slavish what a word to use. Slavish political leaders, slavish to the West, get a free pass. We are doing coups to establish our sovereignty and you attack us. Very interesting. They are putting pressure on the African Union. We'll see what happens. I mean, you know, it's early days, right? Today is the 1st of August. Not even a week since that coup has happened. Uh, Kambale, Musavi and I have an article which will come out from Globetrotter explaining how this coup took place. Um, but, you know, again, it's early days. We've got to watch carefully, talk to people on the ground, understand what's happening. But for sure, the anti-Western sentiment rising daily on the African continent, enormous. Yeah, like you said, I think we have to keep watching, but I think it there are there is some potential promise there, um, definitely, from what I could tell. But, yeah, I think we definitely need to keep watching. Um, and I guess... Uh, to kind of come back to the historical point um, on what you say about coups and the military. And I, and I also appreciated your writing about the military because I often don't find for all that happens that uh, enough people really address the military directly, like their role in struggle, good or bad. Um, so when the military's the one kind of leading the, I guess, leading the people, and it, and it sounds like in this particular case, in the Sahel, like that you... That really didn't, didn't really seem like there wasn't much of an alternative there. It seemed like that was kind of the the people who had to do it. Uh, but how do we understand uh, military coups with, for, in relationship when they're trying to fight for sovereignty? And how how does that uh, mobilize or demobilize the people? Like how I guess just kind of give us analysis of how should we how should we how how can we can understand that maybe to help us have some have a particular have a the correct lens to view this situation we're talking about to, to, so we so we're not just caught up in the romanticism of just kicking out the french and you know and and africa will unite like i think that's a little too simple but but also wanting to see that if that's possible as well well in the 1960s there were a series of coups on the african continent some reactionary, some not reactionary. You know, the coup in Ghana, for instance, against Kwame Nkrumah, reactionary coup yeah, built and developed by the CIA, the coup against Patrice Lumumba 1961 in the Democratic Republic of Congo, reactionary coup and so on. But those are not the only coups. In South Africa, a communist 
journalist and, and writer, Ruth first, um, was very interested in trying to pass out exactly the questions you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a terrific book called From the Barrel of a Gun, yeah. which from which I learned a lot. And it's actually reading her book that I um, developed this kind of silly idea of the general's coup and the colonel's coup. See, uh, what is the difference? Look, generally uh, in the third world, uh, in the militaries, the generals all come from established landed families, uh, families from the upper ends of the bourgeoisie, trader families, and so on. Sometimes old royal families as well. The colonels, the captains, these are the highest ranks possible for working class peasant families. You know, you have to be extraordinarily gifted uh, as a, as a, um, you know, as a, uh, uh, you know, like a sergeant, if you get to be a sergeant from a peasant family, you have to be extremely gifted to become a captain or then a colonel. Um, so there's a class reality inside militaries in the third world. When we look at coups run by generals, like the coup led by General Pinochet in, in, in Chile, Chile 50 years ago, 1973, or the generals in Brazil in 1964, or General um, uh, Suharto in Indonesia 1965. These are reactionary coups, not only because they're backed by the West and the CIA and so on, but also because they carry with them the class character of their own origin, you know, in most cases, not all. Obviously, there are generals who break ranks with their class and so on. But in some, most of the people are of this kind. You know, these are, you know, coups to establish you know, uh, the old social classes, the elite classes uh, in their place to maintain them. But then there are other coups, you know, there are coups that are driven by these captains and colonels who come from rural areas, who come from, you know, the petty bourgeoisie, upper end of the working class and so on. Um, these people are interesting. You know, one of the examples of a person like that was General, uh, sorry, Colonel Mamar Gaddafi. Gaddafi comes from this kind of background, hard scrabble background, you know, um, and they do the coup for a couple of reasons. One, because the rank and file are not getting paid enough. Okay, there's a lot of coups uh, in the third world that take place because the rank and file are not getting paid enough. It's pretty interesting that these are military coups because a military has a grouse, you know, on the one side. But there are also examples. Ruth first goes over this, but we can look at it from today. There are examples of coup d'etats led by working class and peasant members of the military who are frustrated with the elites, frustrated with the inability of the left to advance their causes, frustrated in general with the weak position of their class. The attempted coup by Hugo Chavez in 1992 in Venezuela is of a piece. You know, Chavez comes from a rural area. He comes from a poor family. Um, he comes out of the frustration of the inability of the left to move against the bourgeoisie. In 1992, he attempts, um, you know, a coup d'etat. It fails. Mm -hmm. uh, he then apologizes. Then he takes the political road. But Chavez is just like Sankara, uh, who... Um, nine years beforehand, in 1983, conducted a coup in what was then called Upper Volta, frustrated with the lack of movement in the country, frustrated with the imperialist bloc and so on, reflecting his own origins, you know, from a relatively impoverished family, Sankara does a coup. These are the colonel coups, these are the captain's coups. Now, there's nothing to glamorize here. Um, Sankara is a unique instance because he used the coup to attempt to democratize the country as much as possible. You know, he tried his best and then he was assassinated in 87. Um, Chavez decided that maybe the coup road is not a good road. And he took the election road. He built a massive alliance and won the election in 1998-99. Um, why I'm saying this is that there's both something inevitable in countries where the left is very weak and where there's frustration among the working class, peasantry, popular classes, and then their representatives are not to be found in left-wing parties, which sometimes don't exist, mm -hmm. but they are to be found in the mid-ranks of the military. Um, it's a political act, okay? You know, uh, I'm not a great defender of military coups in general. I'm very much opposed to the military entering politics, but I also understand the real movement of history. 
um, you know, history is not made by morality or by principles. History is made by the facts. And the mm -hmm. facts are that in Niger today, there really isn't an opposition of the left that would have been capable of carrying some of the agenda of the people like Abdul Rahim Chich, who, who is the titular head of government now, um, or General Modi. You know, th there isn't that political platform. That's the fact. They acted out of the facts. This is not a principal defense of coups. It is, on the other hand, a principal defense of the right of people to try to establish their dignity and sovereignty. No, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I, I, again, I think I think that's the last point you made as far as there may not be another outlet, and it, and any, I think it even goes back to our points about one party states and again it's just this idealism that there's this there should be this perfect vehicle in which sovereignty and revolution and whatever whatever people view to be good this perfect vehicle that it has to come through and then if it doesn't come through that vehicle then it's it's inherently bad without any real analysis of what's on the ground you know like no exactly sense of, like what preceded it why they got here so just laying out that history even about and i hadn't really thought about that part you said earlier about how the french came in again like to fight off this you know the the al-qaeda elements and were unsuccessful i don't even know if unsuccessful would be the right word but they they did not do what they said they were going to do they those elements were not eliminated and then you know so people have seen that so some of it's not even just the kind of older history of the French but it, uh, the colonial history like you know that we all know but even more recent like in the last 10 years or so um, so we always have to look at the conditions on the ground 